Hello, uh, my assignment is to talk about the spirituality of work. And when most people hear this phrase, it strikes them as uh, quite an oxymoron. There's a little place on uh, the corner of my block, it's called 21 Jumbo Shrimp. Jumbo Shrimp, that's a oxymoron. And then I have a good friend on the north side, he tells me we're going to have the contending Chicago Cubs, that's another oxymoron, two things that don't fit together. And spirituality of work sounds just like that, two words that don't go together. But I want to suggest in, a, in just a few minutes how I, along with several other spiritual teachers, believe that a spirituality of work is the way for all Christians. So let's try to unpack this phrase and, and maybe first of all by saying what it is not. A spirituality of work is not a coding of Christianity that is sprinkled around the office or around the neighborhood. It's not some sugar that you'd apply to a situation. It is not proselytizing. And along those lines, it is not using faith as an advertisement. Now, I know there's some uh, important legal cases that are before the courts right now, but in a sense, there's no such thing as a Christian business if what that means is the promotion of one's faith. In another sense, uh, all business, all daily life, should accord with the plan of God. It doesn't have to be Christian, but it, it fits the plan of God. But what happens is that over time, businesses and other institutions, they drift away from their original purpose, their original aspiration. And often that business or that agency then loses connection with its workers and with its customers, its clients, and ultimately with God's purpose. And finally, what it is not, uh, spirituality of work is maybe less about business ethics, although that's important, than it is about the meaning of work, the meaning of daily work, the meaning of daily life. So now, what, what is a spirituality of work? Well, uh, in only a few moments here, we could just maybe describe how it unfolds. And it unfolds around the practice of specific virtues. A virtue, by definition, is something done habitually. So, if you help a, a person cross a busy street today, well, that's, that's laudable, but we need to know whether you're going to do this habitually or you were just looking for a tip or something like that before we would be able to say you are a virtuous person. You exercise care and concern for the elderly habitually. An institution, then, is a social habit, and an institution that accords with God's plan is a good social habit, a virtuous social habit. So think of it this way. If the institutions in your area cooperate with God, with the plan of God, and they stay true to their purpose, then it's easier for people in your area to be holy. And if institutions are dysfunctional, then it would take a conscious, pre, almost a preoccupied attention, a preoccupied virtue to remain holy. And so what we want are institutions that predictably do what they're supposed to do. 
Um, let's take the example of marriage, an institution. The institution of marriage should carry fidelity and care for children as a routine manner. But if the institution is in disarray, then it's much harder for people to be faithful and for children to succeed. And we have the uh, new and somewhat startling statistic that last year, for the first time in our country, the majority of living arrangements occurred outside the institution of marriage. This simply means that people who are going to be faithful and who are going to help their children succeed need to bring more conscious attention to what they are trying to do than if the institution of marriage uh, was taken for granted. So the idea of wedding rings and the idea of anniversaries and the idea of uh, simple courtesies afforded to a spouse, those are all reminders within the institution to make it easy. Now, <clears throat> the same thing is true in banking. The same thing is true in governing. And the same is true in health care. Those institutions, when they stick close to their proper function, make it easy for people within those institutions to be holy, to be whole, both the workers and the clients and customers. But when those institutions are somewhat uh, disarrayed, people have to, in a frustrating manner, if they're going to uh, try to carve out something worthwhile, almost fight against the institution. So a spirituality of work challenges us to have harmonious, well-oiled, properly functioning institutions that implicitly, not, not with any uh, advertising, implicitly comport to the plan of God. So what are some of these business virtues? There is uh, among them competence, social justice, which I contend is usually misunderstood, compassion, gratitude, and several others. So, um, now in, in upstate New York, there are, well, today there's a lot of craft breweries opening up, but there are two venerable craft breweries in upstate, and by the way, uh, people in New York City consider anything uh, north of Yonkers to be upstate, but uh, we're talking about the main part of the state of New York, two craft breweries. Both, by the way, are union, uh, union places, union shops. One of them is along the Mohawk River, and one is along the Genesee River. The one along the Mohawk recently had a fire. Its brewing capacity was expected to stop for perhaps six months, maybe longer. However, the owner of the Mohawk brewing facility got a call from the uh, chief executive at the Genesee Brewery. And he said, I talked with the union. It was unanimous. We knock off earlier in the week. Your crew comes with your recipe and uses our equipment. And then uh, presumably that brewery had extra vats and uh, the Mohawk people could stay in a motel or hotel, or they could commute the three or four hours it would take uh, to go to that brewery. A reporter then asked the Genesee owner why he did it. He gave a very simple answer. He said, we've known the Mohawk people a long time. We are fellow craftsmen, and they would certainly do the same for us. I contend that this simple example shows the virtue of gratitude 
and that gratitude trumps competition. With no hesitation, this was done, and it was routine. It was routine. It was it was a almost as if uh, there was an agenda item at that brewery that we would take up when one of our competitors experiences a disaster. Those brewery owners recognize that the river that supplies the water for their beverage was God made. They recognize that the customers for their product were God created. The two owners and the unions appreciate that the original gift has to keep being given by moving on to others inside the profession. In a later uh, talk in this series, we're going to hear about stewardship. That's another name for this, that they were responsible stewards for the natural gifts that they had been given for all of the talent and the uh, uh, work that went into their business and the response to that gift was to give it away. The other uh, virtue that is associated with the spirituality of work that I, I mentioned was social justice. And when I said that these brewery owners moved inside their profession, that's the piece I think that is misunderstood in social justice. Uh, GAP, uh, which, you know, GAP also includes Old Navy and the Banana Republic, says that its minimum wage is too low and thus GAP is immediately increasing the minimum wage in its company to $9 and then next year up to $10. GAP wants to retain employees and particularly as it introduces new customer services it does not want to keep retraining people. GAP also takes notice of some studies that say that uh, there is a link between a pay increase and increased productivity up to a point. GAP's unilateral behavior on wages is not an example of social justice. It's compassionate, it's good business, uh, it's a response to the needs of its workers, but in and of itself it is not yet social justice. What has to happen, GAP and other retailers have to caucus through their trade associations and get the wage among reputable companies up to ten dollars or ten dollars ten cents as is being recommended. Then we have social justice. Not price fixing, not collusion, cooperation, conversation. The act of social justice is organization from the inside. The outcome of social justice is improved policies or institutions. I say I think this virtue is misunderstood because many people presume that social justice has to involve protest and that social justice is normally something done on the weekend, something that people do uh, outside of their work hours, but that's not mainstream social justice. It is looking around inside your own institutions for like-minded people, aggregating those people, and trying to improve the institution as you are able. This requires another virtue that has to be cultivated over time, the virtue of prudence. Not everything can be accomplished all at once. Social justice, the act is organization, the outcome is improved policies or institutions. And people who have this virtue, and again a virtue is something that's habitual, become allergic to injustice. They look around and try to see what's possible. 
Keep in mind, please, that social justice is incremental. In the gap, may be setting a trend, but another step is necessary. And social justice, uh, as I say, is a key virtue in the spirituality of work. And there's many other virtues. Competence, I mentioned, uh, this simply means that good intentions are not enough. You cannot be a good business person, a good worker, simply because you, you have good intentions. You have to practice your work, your craft, your, your task with excellence. I want to say something in conclusion, maybe a little more personal, um, pertaining to a spirituality of work. Our, our culture in this country is, from its beginning, individualistic. And there is a very good dimension to this. Uh, this is why we, as a country, have achieved, as a society, have achieved so much. Because we prize the dignity of the individual. <clears throat> but, excuse me, but it, it, this notion of individualism often carries over into the spiritual life. And I'm afraid that the normal association people have with spirituality is some kind of personal quest. I am going out and carving out a spirituality. Now, individual spiritual direction, that's a good thing. And individual uh, spiritual meditations, practices, disciplines, those are all good things. But mainstream spirituality, and that's why I'm going to suggest that the spirituality of work is proper for all Christians, is in a way suggested to us by our culture, and it is mediated through a tradition. Uh, Kathleen Norris gets at this a little bit, talking about the spirituality that is suggested by Dakota, by the Dakotas. Uh, Octavio Paz, uh, the great Mexican philosopher, essayist, also gets at this trying to talk about the spirituality that is suggested by Mexico. And uh, Richard Rodriguez uh, has picked up this sensibility from Octavio Paz and talks about what a spirituality as suggested by Mexican-American culture might be like. Let me say it another way. I, I don't think there are too many people that can make sense of the spiritual life on their own. There are some, not too many. I think most of us need help. And I think most of us would do better in the spiritual life doing things together. And so I want to conclude by recommending support groups. And a support group is any group that meets regularly, so regularly four times a year, six times a year, and reflects on the transcendent, reflects on the spiritual. For just shy of 35 years, I've been participating in a weekly Crisio group reunion. We started with six. Uh, they're all guys, by the way. They don't have, they don't have to be, but we are. We are down to three. One has died. Two have moved. We get together every Friday for lunch. And like guys anywhere, we talk about sports. We talk about politics. But then we have three set questions that pertain to our daily life. And we answer those questions round robin style without giving cheap advice. And I say we've done this every, nearly every single Friday for all of these years. And I, I will tell you there are a lot of Fridays that I have deadlines to meet. I don't care to go. And it is true of the other guys that the two that are remaining, one is a real estate agent and one is a, 
a uh, family attorney. Uh, and yet, we are faithful to the group. And I will also say that over many, many years, this has been very beneficial to each of us, and together it's been beneficial. Let me quickly give you the three questions. I, I think a support group has to have some structure, but not too much structure. So that's that's just a rule of thumb that I've I've experienced. Here's the questions. First question is a trick question. What has been my moment closest to Christ in the previous week? And it's a trick question because I don't want to sound stupid going to the lunch. And so during the week, I am disposed to be looking for the presence of Christ. And one thing all of us have discovered over the years is that that moment was not conscious to us during the week. It was only upon reflection on Friday that the meaning of the moment uh, took on its spiritual character. The other thing we've noticed with this question is that that close moment is often not an exhilarating moment. It is often something we had to really struggle with at work or a particular personality who showed up in the office. or It, it often is a reflection ultimately on the cross of Christ. Second question, what has been my study the previous week? And this question recognizes that there is an intellectual dimension to the spiritual life and we, we just comment about something we've read or maybe something that's been on uh, television or, or you have seen a video like this. And then the third question uh, is, it's got a lot of parts but each person is free to answer whatever part they like, or all the parts. What have been my positives and negatives, or my apostolic success or failure, family, work, and community? So that's three times two if you want to name a success and a failure. Uh, and the idea here is that we are recognizing that there's an action component to the spiritual life. We go through this whole routine and we've already talked about uh, politics and sports and we fed our lunch and we're back to work within about one hour. Uh, once in a while we try as a group to focus on something that maybe we could do together uh, to help the community. That's not always and, and not too frequent. Uh, our wives know each other and we have gone to the, wedi the weddings of our children, but it is not a social group per se. And I think that's one of the reasons it, it works. Uh, we're very friendly with one another, but we are not calling each other back and forth during the week about it other things. We have a purpose and if we can stay true to that purpose we accomplish what we are trying to accomplish. This is just one example of a support group that focuses on daily life. I think we need it. I think uh, the first time out you may find that the people in the group are not uh, your type. They're not helping you. I, I recommend that people give it a chance three, four sessions, but if it isn't for you, don't, uh, don't do something negative. Drop out and perhaps try another group. These are just some of the elements uh, about the spirituality of work. I am going to uh, suggest that uh, we have some information available that will appear, and uh, you are welcome to contact me for more information about, I think, a very vital concept. Thank you for your attention.